Welcome back, everyone, to Hearts of Iron 4, Kaiserreich, China Rework, Liang Wang Click, The Ambush. Uh, as part of the <laughs> guarding the body, as part of, so basically Lu Zhongting, uh, recap, Lu Zhongting, the fucking warlord of uh, Guangxi province, has died. Um, so the person that has been leading Guangxi since 1911, um, all the way to, to today, which, by the way, uh, this guy was a bandit, uh, in case I didn't mention that before. He was a bit like uh, Zhang Zuolen, someone who rose up through banditry, and then the Qing army uh, took him on, sort of, in one way or another, uh, to suppress uprisings, and so he became sort of legitimized that way. Uh, so he's dead, and... Uh, Lu Zhongqing's body is on display at the former governor's re residence, with family and close friends watching over the deceased. While Governor General Chen and some close associates were part of the guard for the day, uh, unknown assailants approached him, brandishing handguns. Uh, a firefight quickly ensued. So either the entourage is gunned down, or the assailants fail and lay dead. Now, since we're... I want to play Federalist, let's definitely not have Chen Jiuming die. So, failed attempt at, on Governor Chen. Reacting in time to their assailants, Chen Zhongming and his associates managed to escape unscathed. It was quickly realized that they were under Guangxi Governor Ma Ji, um, and they quickly made their way out of Nanning. So, uh, basically, Ma Ji, who was where is he? Who was Lu Zhongting's second in command? Uh, in fact, he was the younger adopted son of Lu, uh, basically is turning on us, even though we helped him. The motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> glorious. Absolutely amazing. So basically, Maji is a piece of shit. Uh, by the time they reached Guangdong, the Guangxi clique had already mobilized their armies ready to take leadership of Liang Wang by force. Upon his return, Governor General Chen made an impromptu speech to the Guangdong Provincial Assembly, rallying them against the tyrannical warlord of Guangxi and to defend their hard-earned liberties. Of course, the diarchy falls. The second Guangdong-Guangxi war. So basically the diarchy, I'm guessing, is like, yeah, Guangxi plus Guangdong. And here we are. Wait. We're gonna get the event any day now. There we go. The diarchy has fallen, and the two provinces have been unable to settle their differences diplomatically. The new warlord of Guangxi is unwilling to recognize. Uh, okay, is unwilling to recognize um, Guangdong's supremacy over Nianguang, and his ambitions cannot coexist with the ideals of the eastern counterpart. Uh, both cliques have now taken up arms. Liang Guang's future will thus be settled on the battlefield. So either I play as uh, Guangxi, as Ma Ji, or I play as Chen Jiuming. Chen Jiuming will prevail! Here we are. There is the Guangxi clique. We are now the Guangdong clique and not the Liang Guang clique because we're now only one Guang instead of two Guangs. And there we go. We are now at war. Now there is a bit of an issue, uh, and that is the fact that the... Ooh, okay. That is the fact that the um, uh, the Guangxi are gonna have more troops than we do, so we're gonna have to mobilize some supporters. Let us mobilize the rural militias. Uh, a large part of both Guangxi and Guangdong's militia corps is under the command of the rural gentry. Now, the gentry um, are basically the sort of for sort of lower upper class of ancient China, essentially. They're a mix between um, intellectuals and landlords, essentially. Uh, now, a lot of people characterize them as just simply um, the people who have an education to sort of undertake imperial uh, examinations without actually being a bureaucrat. And so, uh, these are the sort of, they're basically the ruling class, uh, at the local level. Uh, and what they did during times of, uh, sort of danger is, as I already kind of explained with Guangxi, uh, they sort of formed their own self-defense units in the areas that they operate in. And, um... 
they make sure that those forces act as militia instead of bandits. And obviously the line is pretty um, narrow. As like Obviously, like for example, in the Guangxi clique you had Lu Zhongting, and Lu Zhongting is a bandit turned soldier. So essentially, are they bandits, are they soldiers? Both. Uh, however, the gentry are very much not bandits. They're sort of upholders of the traditional order. As uh, you know, obviously, um, being generally they're not the same as the landlords, but they're most of the gentry were in one way or another landlords, and they're not the same as the scholar bureaucrats. But pretty much all of the scholar bureaucrats, in one way or another, were coming from gentry. Uh, and by scholar bureaucrat, I mean um, basically the mandarins, like the people who ruled in the Qing Empire in, in terms of being integrated in the state administration. Although it didn't have as much of a role in China as it did in Europe on many uh, sort of spheres of society. So that's basically that. And in Guangxi, especially this whole militia system was very, very much um, developed. Because essentially Guangxi is kind of like uh, China's far west in a way. Uh, the reach of the state was always difficult over here because like it's not that easy to see on a Hearts of Iron map. But as you can see, it's mostly like a valley around Nanning surrounded by a bunch of mountains. All this terrain is pretty impassable on the border with Indochina, Vietnam, um, Yunnan and Hunan. And basically, the only traversable path is the west, the Tupuro River, which leads into the West River, uh, which goes all the way up here. Uh, which is basically a navigable river that can be traversed, but everything else really cannot be traversed. And so, basically, really, the basis of the Guangxi uh, economy and political control was based around the river. Uh, the valley near the river was uh, basically just like Guangdong, essentially, because it traded with Guangdong a lot. And a lot of Han Chinese immigrants came through there. Uh, probably should get that. A lot of the Han Chinese immigrants came through there. Now, basically, uh, Guangxi is native to a uh, minority group called the Zhuang. Or rather, the in Guangxi, the natives are a minority group called the Zhuang. In fact, even today, um, Guangxi uh, officially is called the Guangxi... Um, wait, where are the militias? What the fuck? Fighting for momentum. Oh! Gains victory imminent. We expect the war with the rival quickly to be a quick one. Okay. Effects when completed. Okay, interesting. So to complete the Guangxi clique has more than 40% surrender progress. Oh, interesting. Well, it would be a whole lot fucking easier if we ha actually had the the fucking people's militia or whatever. Anyway, I'm gonna let him... I'm gonna let him uh, actually encircle me. The current motion will be voted on? What the fuck, the legation council? Why are we in the legation council? We're definitely not supposed to... The current motion on the floor is the restoration of British voting rights. What the fuck? Interesting. Anyway, um... Even today, like, Guangxi is called the Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region. A bit like how, um... Xinjiang, or Xinjiang, is the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. You know, obviously supposed to represent, like... That's a minority group, and they have an autonomy over this area. Come on, move. You are now a bad man. You are now also a bad man. Not a bat man, but a bad man. <laughs> this would be a bad time to be a bat man in China, or to have bat man friends. Aha, um, uh -huh, that's a coronavirus joke, XD. Anyway, so basically, uh, the Zhuang, for a long, long time, have been in conflict with the Han Chinese, who were sort of encroaching on their traditional territory. And uh, this has basically been ongoing since, like, the Han Dynasty, so basically, you know, the time of the Roman Empire. Uh, however... Oh, Jesus Christ, where is he going? He's going here, right? 
Okay. I need to really, like, focus for this, because since I didn't get any bloody fucking militias <laughs> from the event that's supposed to give me militias, this is going to be uh, a little more difficult. Oh yeah, right, we can mobilize uh, the Merchant Corps, too. Right. Mobilize the Merchant Corps. Oh, the Merchant Corps does mobilize. Shang Tuan. Oh, Shang Tuan. Uh, so Shang is like a merchant. Or commerce in general, but Shang Zhen is a merchant. And Tuan is a core. <laughs> so Shang Tuan is the Merchant Corps. Hilarious. Um, right. So basically the whole thing with the Zhuang is that they were sort of trying to maintain their independence historically. And so that combined with the fact that there is all this sort of horrible terrain in Guangxi um, sort of combined to make this area famous to be sort of a lawless, uh, crazy place, essentially. And not just the Zhuang are there, but also a bunch of other... Um, a bunch of other minority ethnicities, such as the Miao Yao, uh, and so all these ethnicities at various times sort of rebelled a lot, and in fact, like I've read somewhere that during the Ming Dynasty, which lasted from like the late 1300s to uh, 1660s, uh, or sorry, to the 1640s, basically there were like 200. Rebellions in uh, Guangxi. Wait, what the fuck happened? See, I saw that the game like going, like doing something, but apparently not. Um, yeah, I'd really like to do this. Region for king. What's the difference? Obviously. Wait, just just let him move. Just let him move. That's fine. Now he's in the open terrain. And so now he's in a bad spot. Excellent. Oh, yep. Look at that big brain number two encirclement. And I think if we take that Ning, he's gonna be capitulated. Uh, Liu Jiang is the new capital. Ooh, look at that! Is that 100%? They are 100% towards capitulation. Baited and outsmarted. Anyways, so, uh, Chen Jiuming secures Liang Guang. Despite internal opposition and the, the revolt of the Guangxi clique, Chen Jiuming has remained at the head of Liang Guang. With his rule and popularity more secure than ever, he will have the ability to push further towards his ideals, should the situation in the rest of the region allow it. A federal and truly democratic China. Chen will free China! Oh, Jesus Christ. So, we get, um, we get generals, or, yeah, the, the, the defeated generals join uh, back into our clique, which is hilarious. The Social Liberal Party will now be called the uh, Public Interest Party Moderate. Ooh, okay, so basically the Grand Republican League is defunct. And the Public Interest Party becomes the ruling party. Are we going to become Social Democrat? Yeah, the change of popularity of Social Democracy plus 10%. Add Chen Yan Sheng, Huang Ding Cheng, Song Xiunan, and Wei Bang Ping. Reintegration of the rebel army moves the capital to Guangzhou. Oh, so that's in case like we lost the capital. Uh, reintegration of the rebel army. For the most part, the soldiers and even generals and warlords, or sorry, of warlord or provincial armies tended to be more concerned about defending their homes from invaders and bandits rather than matters of national importance. As such, we can reintegrate the rebel army with relative ease once their treacherous leaders are dealt with. After all, they are fellow Chinese, even if they, are pre if, if they previously served a wrong master. They can still redeem themselves or return to their homes. So obviously, the Guangxi army will be reintegrated, that's hilarious. That is a cool mechanic and is pretty much, quote-unquote, historically accurate. Uh, so these are Bubing Jen six things. Well, these are Guangdong Bubing Jen. Oh right, oh. let's just make you all the same templates, so that I don't have any problems. And uh, I suppose we can. Oh, glorious in the Chinese Union. How the fuck did they? I, I... 
how exactly have they don't they oh maybe they get like an event right to uprise over there can we send volunteers to them we could send volunteers to them fucking amazing No, not... Shit. We sent volunteers to the Germans. Fuck me. Jesus Christ. Anyway, let's... let's. <laughs> Through the whirlwinds of time. Back we go. Anyway. That was totally... Um... That was totally intentional. All right. So we're just gonna do the same thing that we did last time. All right, they're fucked. Excellent. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Anyway, uh, gate hashtag big brain gameplay aside. Um, there we are. Our army's back. Put you back into booping Jen. Fuck off. Send volunteers to the right person this time. Excellent, excellent. Anyway, so basically, um, what was I saying? Basically, Guangxi was a poor, lawless, um, and very heavily militarized place. No, you're already... I mean, Chen Mingxu. Um, and this was only exacerbated by the fact that during the sort of mid to late Qing, there was a bit of a crisis, as it may. Now, this crisis... Hmm, right, these things... Oh, let's get the uh, research slot. This crisis... What had a lot to deal with uh, sort of the supply of land that was available and so f basically peasants in richer regions had less and less land to work with um, so there was a lot less land per capita than before this obviously caused a lot of social um, problems and peasants from richer regions tended to migrate towards um, poorer regions such as Guangxi so basically Guangxi was uh, not really flooded with uh, migrants, but definitely experienced a bigger uh, inflow of migrants coming from not only uh, Canton, so basically Cantonese migrants through the river network, as it had been for a long, long time, but also, for example, Hunanese coming over from the mountains, um, and also Hakka, who are um, basically uh, people who migrated from central China in like the 13th century to south China which are pretty distinct from other southern Chinese they're more they're more akin to central Chinese and it's it's weird it's weird as fuck nobody knows wait the Germans the Germans are not at war with the Indo Chinese but they have troops in Indochina this is an opportunity for some massive big brain. Oh, there goes the left Guomindang. Are we about to get fucking invaded? I think we might be about to get fucking invaded by uh, Anqing Click. They are definitely the most dangerous foe that we have right now. Wait. Why do you not have the Field Marshal? An offer from Funk... From Fengtian? What the fuck? In a rather surprising development, the, uh, the Fengtian has invited us to attend their conference in Shenyang. Wait, their conference? What the fuck? Isn't that after they take Beijing? Oh no, that's the unification conference. Perhaps another one. Uh, their goal is to create a broad coalition against the Juli clique. Okay. So far, they seem to have had some success in bringing the other warlords on board. Perhaps if we attended, we could get them to agree on some sorely needed reforms. How should we respond to their invitation? Oh, Jesus. Um, 
Okay, like in real life, Chen would go. Most definitely, but... I don't know. I don't fucking trust Zhang Zuolin, but whatever. Let's go to Shenyang. I have no idea what could be the result of this, but... America brings doubt. It is no secret that Chen Zhiming's beliefs are heavily inspired by the United States of America, or at least what was once the USA. The Second American Civil War has not been ignored by Chen's opponents. They see the fighting in the USA as proof that Chen Zhiming's ideals are doomed to fall, as it did on the other side of the ocean. For his part, Chen reminded his opponents that his proposal for China differed uh, significantly from the American system, and was quick to make parallels between the current states of China and the United States. Um, its presidential system puts too much power in the hands of the president compared to the legislature, making no different the current constitution to the current constitutional quote unquote monarchy of China. Although to be fair, um, no more constitutional monarchy here. Um, while comparing demagogues such as Long and Reed and uh, and warlords such as MacArthur to Sun Yat-sen, Wang Jinwei, and Wu Peifu, uh, respectively. would be lovely if uh, the Vietnamese were to complete the encirclement uh, while I hold these guys. Ooh, they're actually coming in with extra troops, but nine hours, three days. Okay, excellent. This could be really, really good. Uh, while Chen Jiangming maintains that the failure of America is not inherently due to federalism or democracy, the argument made obvious uh, the doubts that many people feel towards this proposal, obviously. All right. Excellent. Oh. Amazing! Look at that Vietnamese AI. Look at that Vietnamese AI. That is exactly what we wanted. Uh, wait, how do we have the rate? Oh, right, we, we got it through a uh, thing. A thing. I am big brain. Wait, I should probably research industrial tech this time. <laughs> Y'all remember last time when I had backyard furnaces in 1945. Anyway, so basically, uh, he's Tang. He's gonna have a civil war soon, so he's no he's no danger. Okay. What was I saying again? So yeah, basically, Tsuolin refuses our demands. Evidently, Tsuolin could simply not bite the hand that fed him. By declaring his oppositions to the uh, anti-concessionists, he showed his color for all of China to see. Okay, so the concessionists are the people who are behind Anqing. There's absolutely no way we can side with Feng Tian under these circumstances. Wait, by declaring his opposition to the anti-concessionists. Oh, okay, so Feng, uh, Feng Tian is like... Um, don't murder for foreigners or whatever, because um, he's sponsored by the Japanese, obviously. Um, what we, while we'd hope that we he'd see reason, we can't see we can't say we're surprised either. Our delegation has left the conference earlier, leaving Tsuolin with his Japanese cronies. What to expect from a Japanese puppet? Yes. In the meantime, we are supporting the great uh, Chinese people of Indochina. Oh, whoops, oops, definitely the, the free people of Indochina in their fight against imperialism. Anyway, basically, we were talking about Guangxi. Like, um, all these uh, all these people were coming in from all these different areas, right? And that's obviously a bit of an issue. Because the province was already poor, it was already barren, it already had a lot of issues when it came to... Uh, land distribution, um, and especially land partitioning between the various factions that were playing there. This was in the early stages of the 19th century, and uh, these tensions eventually boiled over into the Hakka, the, the central Chinese migrants, uh, sort of forming around this religious cult figure called Hong Xiu Chen, and that was Hong Xiu Chen, and that was the Taiping Rebellion. Um, and all these sort of, um, let him move. All these military organizations that have been building up, sort of paramilitary militia organizations, uh, basically were unleashed. And there was a, like, the Taiping eventually just left and went northeast, eventually reaching Nanjing. So yeah, they, they made quite the march. 
but uh, the entire sort of provincial system was basically now uh, heavily militarized. So that's Guangxi. Guangdong, on the other hand, is very, very different. Oh, wait, the Beijing government VK Wellington coup. Oh, God, what the fuck is happening? All right, let, let's take the third, the third Chantal conference because things are starting to heat up quite heavily. Okay, so the Beijing government, this is based illegitimate republic. So basically, they have restored... The 1923 Cao Kun constitution. Now, Cao Kun was a fucking big memer who basically bribed the entire government to make himself the president. The fucking second international. Basically bribed the entire government to make himself president. And he passed this, like, very, like, liberal constitution. Uh, mostly just to shut a lot of people up, but he didn't follow it. So it looks like they are trying to restore the Beiyang Republic in one way or another. Ooh, uh, okay, so implement President Ku's reform. Now, uh, they can either go Hu Shi or Wellington Ku. Now, I don't know anything about Wellington Ku, but Hu Shi is a very, very important sort of literary figure. Huh. They're both, anyway, figureheads for uh, Wu Peifu, essentially the military leader of, uh, of the Juli. Who is the, like, defense minister, probably? Yeah, there we go. Wu Peifu. Anyway, we're about to take the, sh the third Shanto conference. What is this? The first and second, second Shanto conference were, were conferences. Were meetings of the Federalist Movement's leaders, right? We, we have divisions. We should probably micro them. Ooh, that's really good. Looks like we're gonna destroy a Schutztruppen Division. We could rally public support, but no. We're gonna conserve our political power, thank you so much. Ooh, right, we could take early mobilization, let's do that. Early movements, or sorry, early um, meetings of the Federalist Movement's leaders joined by delegates of... Uh... Oh, he's dead, excellent. Joined by delegates um, and other national leaders. Uh, to decide the future of the movement. It is time to reunite the movement once more and finally work towards our dream of a federal democratic China and officially break with the Beijing government. Obviously. Amazing. Uh, wait, what? I thought you were dead. The Baltic Wars, of course. The Star Baltic Wars. The Star Wars. Why are there women in my Star Wars? Why is there politics in my video games? <laughs> Imagine someone complaining that there's politics in, like, a Paradox game. That would be just the best thing. Wait, he's lost Saigon. Oh, what an idiot. It's always like this with the AI. You gotta save their their asses. What the fuck is happening around the world? Everyone is just, like, exploding. Tron some more! Yes, Kolchak. Yes. Wait, he's dragged the Japanese in. <laughs> okay, so Russia under Karnilov is now fighting fucking uh, the Bolsheviks, Transamur, and the Co-Prosperity Sphere as a whole. Amazing. Who was Panama annexed by fucking Canada? Canada. What the fuck happened here? I don't know. There was just a bunch of weird, nasty stuff. Uh, ooh, the Jacobin. That's not something you see every day. The Jacobin in France. Big Central American meme fights. Alright. You are now without supplies. Hopefully. He's still got Stumtreng, but Sweden has joined the Reichspacht. Because, of course. Oh, damn. Excellent. The third Shanto conference is... Um, notably, the second one was attended by delegates from both the Guomindang and the Beijing government despite their ongoing conflict. So basically, in like the early 1920s, um, the KMT, which was holed up in Canton, was fighting with the Northern Warlords. And the Beijing government was controlled by different warlords, one at a time, uh, you know, one at a time, I, I say. Like, uh, at different times, different warlords were around. Wait, how is he supplied? 
How is this piece of shit supplied? Anyway. Give me the, some, the defense in depth. Restore civilian control in Guangxi, the provisional federal constitution. Less political power gain. Ooh, we should probably suppress the bandits. Yeah, we should probably end the Guangxi problem as soon as possible. Unlocks the reconstruction plan. Okay. Um, Chen Yingming will now host a third conference. Uh, hoping to bring southern provincial governments into, or sorry, together to agree to a new reconstruction plan for the region and form a provisional government to rival the Beijing and Fengtian governments. And the Guomindang upstarts, although the Guomindang upstarts don't exist anymore. Once more, the strength of the Federalist movement and its up is on the upswing, and there is a real chance for it to become influential in national politics. Towards unity, beginning of the conference. Anyway, uh, we are out of time. The Shantou Conference will be for next time, as we are going to go down the tree. A new China! Obviously. Uh, change the national focus tree to Federalist China. There's another focus tree? Oh my god, yes. Add very low popular support, very low federal authority, the issue of corruption, disrupted military... That's going to be for later. Uh, negotiate for reunification, military nationalization. Okay, excellent. So that's going to be for very soon hopefully so yeah thank you all for watching hope you enjoyed and i'll see you soon